Hello, and welcome to the Mystery Discovery Channel. Today we are going to talk about the Song Dynasty in ancient China. By the end of the Tang Dynasty, the Xianbei aristocracy that built the Tang Dynasty had been cleansed of its power, and the so-called seven clans and five surnames had already disappeared in name only. This meant that the families that monopolized power at the top had physically disappeared, and at the bottom, the class of small landowners of the gentry, the squire groups, had risen to prominence. They very easily banded together at this local level and competed with the central government for power over local governance. The officials sent down by the central government were of course no match for the rural squire groups. So very soon, as long as the region was a little far away from the capital, where the imperial power could not directly intervene, the gentry groups actually controlled the local finance and judicial power. Taxes, labor, justice, and other specific events are all to be collectively decided by the gentry group, and the central government sent down to the border officials are often only as a mascot of the general existence. This is a very interesting change. The gentry group to collective decision-making mode of governance probably can be regarded as a kind of democracy in its infancy. In this direction, the system slowly improved. The central and local authorities established a systematic power distribution template, and the local gentry group decision-making was also institutionalized and process-oriented, and it might be able to develop into a model of gentry democracy under the Great Unifia dynasty and rival the ancient Roman model of parliamentary democracy. But the paradox of Chinese history is that every time there is a down of democracy and civilization, there is an irresistible force of opposition that takes the country down a crooked path, into an abyss, into a darkness from which there is no way out. After the clerical class was wiped out as a whole, the ability of the central government to control power was bound to drop drastically. On the one hand, the control over the localities declined and the squire groups rose. On the other hand, the control over the military center on the borders also declined drastically. The military groups on the borders were already in a state of complete control by the end of the Tang Dynasty in China. Throughout the Tang Dynasty, there was no peace on the border. The aristocratic forces in the army were cleaned out, and the rest of the people were all from a bitter background and had to start from ordinary soldiers, accumulating merits little by little, and slowly growing up in the fight with the nomadic armies on the border. The Tang imperial family has long adopted the policy of prioritizing the promotion of mixed-blooded Hu generals, which hasn't changed even after the Anxi Rebellion. That is, the more complex the bloodline of the Hu tribe, the easier it is to accumulate merit and become a general. After all, the mixed-blooded Hu were generally free from all sorts of social ties and were more willing to stay in the border areas and fight for the rest of their lives. However, these generals came up from the bottom often with strong personal charisma, and in the late Tang Dynasty's history of more than 100 years, this group of generals always appeared in a group of ambitious people, with strong leadership and management skills. If they consciously joined forces with the gentry groups in the border areas, with military power superimposed on local financial power, they could have completely hollowed out the power of the central government and turned it into a de facto vassal state. This situation would not have been fatal to the extent that the clans and towns are cut off. It is just one more side of the border of the magnates. The military leaders of the clans who genuinely wanted to replace Li did not exist at all. In the border area of the nomadic people eyeing, the army is really about the war. The military leaders of the clan cannot engage in hereditary. The new generation of leaders must be selected from the military group of the most able to fight in the generals. Moreover, the border area was poor in material resources and still needed material supplies from the central government. Therefore, the military leaders of the clans, though domineering, did not dare to refuse the orders of the central government. According to this pattern of gaming, the central government and the border towns might be able to game out a brand new pattern of power distribution thus weakening the centralized character of the dynasty. But the most tragic thing happened. History did not leave enough time for the ruling body of the Tang dynasty. At the end of the Tang dynasty, 
the whole country suffered from successive years of natural disasters, with floods, droughts, and locusts, and even the Yellow River was routinely bursting its banks on a large scale, finally bringing about a nation with a famine. Disasters of this magnitude de exceeded the limits of any agricultural era dynasty's ability to copy. As a result, civil unrest arose in all directions, the largest of which the Huangchao Rebellion attacked the capital Chang'an in 882 AD. Since then, the Tang ruling body lost the ability to govern from the center. The succeeding emperors were all puppet emperors, and the Tang dynasty died in 907 AD, when Zhu Wen claimed the throne and established the later Liang dynasty. After that, the country went through 50 years of war under extremely harsh climatic conditions, known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms, a group of ordinary people who struggled from the bottom of the social ladder established various small states. However, they were unable to maintain order for long under the harsh climatic conditions, so they rose and fell. The impact of the Third Little Ice Age completely changed the course of China's history. The seedling of local and border autonomy, which had been expected to mature under the centralized system, was completely aborted. It was as if Chinese history had been cursed and was destined to move step by step towards an extreme centralized system. At the end of the Five Dynasties, Guo Wei and Chai Rong, a pair of adoptive fathers and sons came into being. Guo Wei's family had been generals for many generations, and with his family's pedigree, Guo Wei himself possessed strong military command skills and knew all about the social mobilization of the state. In 951 AD, Guo Wei established the later Han Dynasty, a time when the Little Ice Age had ended and Chinese society was in dire need of restabilization. Guo Wei, on the one hand, pacified the displaced people, distributed land and built water conservancies. On the other hand, he simplified taxes and unified conflicting governmental decrees. These measures were in fact measures to rebuild the economic order after the catastrophe. During this period, Guo Wei sent his son Chai Rong to subdue anyone who was disobedient. In 954 AD, Guo Wei died and Chai Rong succeeded to the throne and established the later Zhou regime. Internally, Chai Rong continued Guo Wei's policy of governance, that is, he insisted on rebuilding and restoring order after the disaster. Externally, Chai Rong tried to re-establish the unification of the Central Plains by fighting in the North and the South. On the whole, Chai Rong did a good job as emperor with his domestic economy recovering quickly and his external victories continuing. All the small states in the East, South, and West were incorporated by Chai Rong. Most importantly, Chai Rong's successive northern campaigns against the Khitan defeated the fierce Khitan cavalry and almost recaptured the 16 states of Yuyun. However, in 959 AD, before the final battle to recover Yuzhu, Chai Rong died of illness at the age of 39. Zhao Kuangyin, a mediocre man, has been on the scene ever since. Zhao Kuangyin was a man who had no presence at all and never showed any ability to stand on his own. He just appeared when Guo Wei sighed of a soldier and then was sent to Chai Rong as a soldier. In the course of Chai Rong's campaigns in the south and north, Zhao Kuangyin slowly rose through the ranks and became a personal officer, whose main duty was to follow Chai Rong around and serve as a bodyguard. So the history books and the records of many historical events at that time, you can see Zhao Kuangyin's name. However, upon further scrutiny, he actually did nothing but appear as a human set-piece. In most of the wars as Chai Rong soldiers, Zhao Kuangyin did not go to war. When the northern expedition of the Khitan, Zhao Kuangyin was on the battlefield a few times. That is only because the situation is critical. Chai Rong himself was forced to wield the sword on the field to cut people. Zhao Kuangyin, as the head of the bodyguard, forced to follow so a little so-called war. Before Chai Rong died of his illness, he saw that the prince was young and feared that the throne would be taken away from him, so he ruthlessly suppressed the real group of generals at the time. Li Chongjin and Zhang Yongde were both imprisoned and robbed of their military power, while Li Yun was thrown far away to guard the border. Then Zhao Kuangyin, 
who had always seemed to be a mediocre and incompetent officer of the personal army, was promoted to be the commander of the Forbidden Army. Chai Rong's idea is also very clear, is just let a mediocre person in charge of the military power, always smooth transition for ten years, cannot make a power grabbing chaos. When the prince grows up, from Zhao Kuang Yin this mediocrity hand to take back the military power is also very easy. However, history has taken a major turn here. Zhao Kuang Yin this mediocre people suddenly showed a huge ambition, completely disproportionate to the strength. In 960 AD, one year after Chai Rong's death, Zhao Kuang Yin fabricated an excuse that the Khitan had violated the border and assembled a large army to send out troops. On the very night that the army left the capital, he made himself emperor at Chen Kiaoyi, a mere 20 miles from the capital and turned around and forced Chai to abdicate, establishing the Song dynasty. When Zhao Kuang Yin, such a mediocre man, suddenly became emperor, the generals of the latter Zhou dynasty were of course unconvinced, and Li Yun and Li Chongjin rose up in opposition. However, although Zhao Kuang Yin was not good at war, he was very good at political maneuvering. He quickly saw the situation that the general trend of the time was to rebuild the social order. Therefore, in order to stabilize the kingdom, rely not on the support of the military generals, but on the tendency of the civil officials group. Zhao Kuang Yin quickly united the civil officials of the later Zhou dynasty with his promise of favorable treatment for the scholarly officials. They collectively turned to Zhao and Song and did not have the slightest intention to rebel. Moreover, Zhao Kuang Yin and his successors really didn't treat these officials of the later Zhou dynasty poorly. Since then, the entire Song dynasty, the royal family to the military group of extremely suppressed, the civil officials have been very favorable treatment. The number of civil officials who were actually beheaded for committing serious crimes was very small, and they were generally sent away. Without the cooperation of civil officials in the central government, there was no way to guarantee the logistics. Li Gyun and Li Chongjin's revolt was simply a lone force, a source of water without a source. Li Gyun tries to form a coalition army with the enemy Northern Han, but even his own son jumps against it. Li Chongjin, on the other hand, was trapped in a lonely city, with his army fleeing every day, completely losing its fighting power. These two men were at their wit's end, so they set themselves on fire and died. Zhao Kuang Yin thus stabilized the throne. Behind this thing there is the inevitable law of history. After the end of the Tang Dynasty and the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms of the Hundred Years of Glacial Period, the Central Plains back to the wind and rainy climate, then the most important thing was to restore order. The people did not care whether they sat on the throne with the surname Guo, Chai, or Zhao. As long as order could be restored, that was all that mattered. Guo Wei and Chai Rong were already trying their best to restore order, and it took them almost ten years to restore agricultural production in the Central Plains. But they hadn't done enough. As military generals, they failed to give a clear explanation to the dynasty. How was power to be distributed in the absence of the noble scholars? How exactly were the civil officials who came out of the gentry groups and the military generals in the border areas going to distribute power? How was the game of power to be played in China? Guo Wei and Chai Rong were both generals at heart, and it was difficult for them to give an answer to this question that was not favorable to the military generals. It is, of course, impossible to limit the power of the generals themselves. Zhao Kuang Yin, on the other hand, had no such burden at all. Although he had been hanging out in the army, he had always held the position of bodyguard beside Chai Rong and had never really independently led an army and fought a battle. To say that he really has any feelings for the army, that can't really be said. What's more, the Song dynasty was just founded and suffered the collective rebellion of the generals of the latter Zhou. If not Zhao Kuang Yin, in time to pull together the group of civil officials, that Zhao family up and down the death do not know how to die. In this light, it is easy to understand the order that Zhao Kuang Yin would have chosen. The dynasty he founded must have dramatically elevated the status of the gentry groups and sharply curtailed the power of the military generals on the borders. And at the same time as a mediocre mediocrity, 
Zhao Kuangyin must have tried to stabilize his rule by all means. He made sure to establish a set of order of superiority, inferiority, and hierarchy, under which he himself, as a mediocre man and even his mediocre descendants, could enjoy the adoration of all the people of the world. As a result, the two major evil policies of the Song Dynasty came into being. The first one was to stigmatize the army, recruit beggars and thieves as the main force of the army, and at the same time to engage in the civil defense against the military, depriving the generals of the power to train, organize, and make decisions about the soldiers, which were all handed over to the civil officials. The only remaining function of the military general is to lead a group of beggars and thieves, mechanical implementation of the established tactics of the civil officials cannot be contrary. If there is a slight violation, even if the battle is won, it is bound to be executed. Of course, completely follow the civil officials in thousands of miles away from the so-called tactics conceived by the same is bound to lose. It doesn't matter. The civil officials will decide that you are not executing well, and they will chop off your head, as usual. In this way, the fighting strength of the Song army was soon exhausted. The entire Song dynasty era was a pure weak chicken when it came to defending against the nomads in the north. That is, at that time, the small ice age has just ended. The climate of the grassland is also warm and pleasant. The nomads do not have a strong desire to occupy the central plains for a long period of time, just satisfied with robbing once and then leave. This allowed the northern Song dynasty to continue its fortunes for 167 years. Later, the climate of the northern grasslands began to get cold. The army of the female genitals firmly south, the northern Song dynasty, simply did not have the power to fight back, and so the death of the country. Secondly, Zhao Kuangyin drastically reformed the imperial examination system, taking Confucianism as the only standard subject for the examination. This is to establish the status of Confucianism in fact. Confucianism, of course, was elevated to the status of Confucianism. I must emphasize here, Emperor Wu's decision to depose the hundred schools and revere only Confucianism was not real and was not put into practice. During the Han Dynasty, there were only two ways to become an official, by examination and by recruitment. That is to say, people with reputation recommended each other to become an official or by promotion, based on their war achievements. Throughout the Han Dynasty, the teachers of the officials were actually based on Taoist doctrines, while the masters of Confucianism, Legalism, and Mohism were able to occupy a place in the officialdom. As for the Three Kingdoms, the two Jin dynasties, the Northern and Southern dynasties, and the five dynasties of Sui and Tang thereafter, wars were frequent, and learning, was, of course, mainly practical. Vague ideas like Confucianism could not even be eaten. Perfected by the Tang Dynasty, the imperial examination system, astronomy and geography, which examines the part of history is very simple, fill in the blanks, and ten questions can come out. Four are considered qualified, the core of the examination, or test practical knowledge. However, the mediocre Zhao Kuangyin changed all this, the imperial examination, from Zhao Kuangyin began, into a mechanical, submissive test. He was to pick out the most disciplined and unquestioning group of people from among the vast number of students, and he succeeded in doing so. By Zhao Kuangyin single-handedly pushed on the altar of Confucianism, what is the essence? Is the rules. Everyone should know the rules and abide by the rules. Between the ruler and the ministers have rules. Between father and son have rules. Up and down between the rules. To abide by the rules is to observe etiquette. This is to limit the person under a fixed identity. Absolutely cannot be overstepped. Anyone who oversteps must be punished. Ruling a country with Confucianism means setting rules and dividing up ranks throughout the country. The squire and landowner naturally had to be one level higher than the farmer and artisan, the bureaucrat was one level higher than the squire, and the emperor was located at the highest position. This was a tight network of social hierarchy. 
All bureaucrats came from the imperial examinations, which were purely Confucian in nature. Those who did not pass the imperial examinations could not even be easily bestowed by the emperor. Thu's so systematic study of Confucianism and history required a great deal of time and financial resources, and ordinary farmers and artisans could not afford to support such an investment. Therefore, those who were able to pass the imperial examinations were basically the sons and daughters of country squires and landlords at all levels. On the other hand, those who did not pass the imperial examinations could not even be given official positions easily by the emperor. The upgrading of Confucianism to Confucianism was a self-castration for ancient China. The whole society was tightly controlled, forbidding any change, any innovation, because even the slightest change could break the rules, the rules, the etiquette, so it must be prevented and any innovation nipped in the bud. The influence of the large squire class was certainly enough to penetrate any field in this country, and there was no longer any place outside the law in this country. However, this penetration did not mean an increase in the state's ability to mobilize society. On the contrary, it meant an increase in social inhibition and self-castration. So the Chinese society gradually lost its vitality and was about to suffer a bitter pain. All the dynasties were about to die from foreign invasion and were about to be occupied by foreigners for a long time. But before the Song dynasty, in front of a great unified dynasty, with strong mobilizing power, foreign troubles were nothing more than scabies. The foreigners rushed in to loot and plunder, and soon had to leave. Otherwise, the emergency mobilization of the dynasty, in spite of the farmland desertion, gave up the seasonal production, can always mobilize hundreds of thousands of troops, even by the simplest relief on the fight for human life can be consumed by the other side. Before the Song dynasty, the great unified dynasties always died of civil unrest, and the foreigners could only take advantage of the time of civil unrest in the Central Plains to break into the Central Plains. However, the Song dynasty lost its ability to mobilize for war after it had castrated itself. The civil officials who came from Confucianism were on the defensive against the military officials, and military generals were not allowed to have any initiative. In the ever-changing battlefield, any improvisation by military generals was strictly forbidden. All generals must strictly abide by the strategy of the civil officials thousands of miles away to deal with the enemy, from the route of marching to the enemy's position. All have strict rules, and this strategy is not confidential notified to the world. Whether it is Western Jia or Catan, before the war hate are already a handful of copies. Then, according to this strategy to send troops, the Song army to beat the bloody head. This unimaginable thing was the military norm throughout the Song dynasty. And by the middle and late Ming dynasty, after Confucianism regained control of the discourse, the military field was likewise in the same state. In the face of successive military defeats, the Confucian officials of the Song dynasty also had to speak with one voice. The generals were incompetent had failed to follow through on the glorious directives of the civil government group and had to be killed outright to revitalize the program. Stigmatizing the military while elevating Confucianism to the status of Confucianism was the new order established by the mediocre Zhao Kuangyin after he sat as emperor. He destroyed the Chinese Empire's ability to mobilize for war at the root and also committed a great crime against the Chinese nation. This imperial dynasty was supported by a tight network of landlords and gentry for a long time. The southern and northern songs combined lasted more than 300 years, yet under the mediocre lineage of the Zhao clan, no more martyrs were ever produced. All the emperors of both the southern and northern Song dynasties were all deadly stupid and short-sighted. However, among these mediocrities, there were a few geniuses in painting and calligraphy, which is the greatest irony of the Song Dynasty royal family, just like the fact that artistic geniuses are often easily produced among severely autistic people. What is even more ridiculous is that, in order to maintain the rule, the Song Dynasty royal family has to take the initiative to provoke the officials' internal strife and party disputes, 
which is called the art of mastery. As a result, the whole country was caught in endless tug of war, and the gentry group was artificially torn apart, so that the mobilizing power of the Song Empire for war was even weaker. Zhao Kuangyin sat as emperor for 16 years. Because he had ingratiated himself with the world scholarly community, he easily pacified the small states south of the Central Plains, and the whole process could be described as uneventful. Often the other side imploded before the Song army even set out. However, when he turned his sights to the north and tried to recover the 16 states of Yuyun, he was surprised to find a different set of rules practiced there. The northern region still still implemented the aristocratic mode of governance and disdained the set of things that Zhao Kuangyin had implemented. There was simply no local scholarly community to draw in, so they could only fight hard. And Zhao Kuangyin's greatest fear is to fight hard battles. In 968 and 969 AD, Zhao Kuangyin attempted two northern expeditions, both to no avail. In 976 AD, Zhao Kuangyin launched the third northern expedition. The army set off not yet two days. Not yet contact with the northern Han army, Zhao Kuangyin suddenly died in the palace, when the year just over 50 years old. The history books on this matter is doubtful. The so-called candles and axes, to younger brother to kill his brother. Younger brother Zhao Guangyi, in order to seize the throne, killed his brother. My speculation on this matter is that all the descendants of the Song Dynasty royal family who are a little older have suffered from stroke, cerebral infarction, and other cardiovascular diseases. Emperor Zhenzong of Song, Emperor Renzong of Song, Emperor Yingzong of Song, and Emperor Shenzong of Song all died because of stroke, which would have been their family genetic disease. At this time was in the northern expedition, his younger brother, Zhao Guangyi, on the strategic issues of the northern expedition, and his brother had an argument. In the process of Zhao Kuangyin emotional sudden cerebral hemorrhage death, this is a relatively logical explanation. For Zhao Kuangyin, the self-castration of the Song dynasty, I have nothing more to say. Let history, as soon as possible, to unveil this page. Welcome to different views of the audience to discuss. Today is here, interested friends. Don't forget to like. Pay attention to the next update. Do not get lost.